Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Today we're going to talk about how to do an ineffective cross-examination. Stay with me on this. This involves the YNW Melly case and I want, to, I want to preface what I have to say by saying, you know, sometimes life gives you lemons and you have to make lemonade, but sometimes you run out of sugar for that lemonade and so you're just really stuck with lemon juice, which isn't particularly palatable. Well, that's kind of what happened in this case, at least with respect to the cross-examination of the lead detective. I want to uh, take out a segment here, and then I will explain to you exactly why it's ineffective. You learned that he lied to you about where the drive-by shooting was, correct? Yes. You went to, what, three different areas to look for evidence of the drive-by of Cortland, what Cortland Henry told you, correct? Yes. You learned at that time that at first he was labeled a victim, but that he now is lying to the police concerning the shooting of two individuals. He was still listed as a victim that day. Even though we knew he was lying to us, but he was still considered a victim at that point. There is such a crime as lying to the police. Yes, sir, it's a misdemeanor. You could have arrested him if he so chose for lying to the police, correct? You're saying that you're arrested a, a potential victim of a violent crime on a misdemeanor? Could you just answer my question? Could you have arrested him? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, the point of that was to paint Bortland Henry as the shooter in this case, because after all, he's lying to the police. And here is the issue that he's trying to make, that he treated Henry differently than he treated Melly, which I don't think is borne out by the evidence, but that's what he is trying to make the point of. Look, you could have you could have gone further. You could have arrested him for lying to the police, and then you could have pressured him, and then maybe you'd gotten some truth. But Bortland is already under indictment for the murders. It's really difficult to understand at this point what the defense is trying to accomplish here. They're trying to paint Bortland as the shooter, but that doesn't really absolve Melly of the conspiracy issue of, you know, working with Bortland to kill these kids. So we'll have to see there's a couple of more things in here that I think are really ineffective, but basically he never ties that back, that failure back to Melly or does anything with that cross-examination other than to point out that the detective is kind of a bad guy. You also learned that there was a problem at Walmart where they got jumped and a, I think a necklace or a bracelet was stolen. A little uh, pendant uh, fell off one of them, yes. Okay. Did you go to Walmart to investigate that? No, sir. I'm going to make him suspect number three. So. Okay. And I'm going to just label him Walmart with a question. Now here what he's trying to do is he's trying to lay out all the possible other people that might have been the shooters in this case. Um, but there's an issue with that. He can't really identify them. It's some supposed person that jumped these people at Walmart. And the only real... Uh, evidence we have of that is the testimony of the people who are suspected of being the shooters in this case. So, or and I don't know if it's a testimony so much as their statements, the statements of these people as, as to what happened. This is really interesting because he could have done more with this, and in fact he did do more by saying, why didn't you go get the videos? And the the detective said, well, look, you know, 30 days later, the videos are gone, and this happened well before. So, the, you know, the, by the time he would have gone to get the, the videotapes, even if he'd gone that day, they would already have been reused. 
Uh, and that's standard practice in the uh, commercial industry where you reuse the same tapes or the same media so that you don't have to continually have a collection of videos or DVDs that are 10 feet high. Jacoby Mills, and Jacoby Mill, Octavius Withers, Octavius Withers, and, and Adrian, Adrian Davis. All eight people that left the recording studio and two uh, have passed away. Correct. Yes, sir. And you knew where all three, all eight of them were living, correct? Yes, sir. And that was at the 18720, whatever that address I read off before. The, the, the Sunset Lakes one, the 184, Sunset 44 Street. You had that address, correct? Yes, sir. And you had observed the bloody scene of inside the Jeep. Correct? Correct. And you knew that Cortland Henry had lied to you. Correct. So, you certainly, at that point, obtained a search warrant to look at that house to see if you could find any blood, any gun, or anything. to tie up what happened in that car, correct? There is no way we could have got a search warrant for that house because there was no nexus to the crime to the house. Now I have to establish a nexus between the two where the judges will not sign the warrant. Did you even try, sir, to get a search warrant and go in front of a judge and say, I got eight people who left the studio they all live in the same house. The driver of the vehicle we interviewed lied, and the inside of the Jeep is covered in blood. And we're looking for the gun or guns and the bloody clothes involved in this. Did you bother to do that, sir? So, like I said before, there was no connection between the house and the, and the, the crime itself. No, the answer. Where we had, where we had blood, where we had evidence, where we had uh, instruments of a crime, we did search warrants. Anytime we had a nexus between the two, we did a search warrant. We never had a nexus between the two. We even went to that, that house that day, knocked on the door. There was no one there. Okay, I have to say that the pacing of this attorney, where he stops every few seconds and asks more of a question. Drives me absolutely crazy. If you're going to ask a question, ask a question. You think about the question before you ask it, not in the middle of it. And more importantly, the pacing is going to put the jury off. It's not going to establish it. It's like he went and watched my cousin Vinny and decided he could, you know, portray that character in the courtroom. He's not doing a good job of it. And here he falls into the trap that lawyers are warned about on day one in law school, which is you do not ask questions that you don't already know the answer to. Now, if he already knows the answer that there has to be a nexus to the crime to get a search warrant, as pretty much anybody who practices criminal law would know, then why do you ask the detective if he went out to get the search warrant when you know he can't get that? And more importantly, the detective knows he can't get that, and that's what the detective says. So even though, yes, it would have been good to find the clothes and the guns and that sort of thing, and searching the house might have been a prudent thing to do, and they would have done it if they'd gotten permission to enter and search the house, but they didn't have it. As the detective testified, there wasn't a person home when they went and knocked on the door. So again, he the the this again, I don't mean to criticize the lawyer too much here because he had been handed a, a bowl of worms and he had to make it look like spaghetti. And he's having a lot of trouble with the sauce here. The issue is that you have to establish some alternate reason for why Melly is not the shooter. And 
he initially started down that path with these eight people and with all the different suspects. But again, he was never able to get a solid hook into the detective at that point. Now, were there things the detective didn't do? Yes. Are there things the detective probably should have done? Yes. But there's only so many hours in a day, and I can guarantee you Melly is not the only murder case he was working on in Broward County at that time. So, again, this is another one of those situations where if, you are a, if you're cross-examining a witness, you do it surgically. You know what you need to get. You ask tight, leading questions. And you don't wander around the courtroom like you're lost. You get in front of the person, you point your finger, and you say, you didn't do this, did you? And unfortunately, while this guy is doing a good job with the dramatics and trying to establish some motion and thereby emotion in the courtroom, at the end of the day, none of it matters because it doesn't exculpate YNW Melly in this killing. So we'll have to see whether or not the jury thought that this was a particularly effective cross-examination, and I suppose if Melly is acquitted, they will believe that it was an effective cross-examination. But as an attorney, if I was grading this guy, I'd give him, I guess I'd give him a B plus because he got handed um, a really awful set of circumstances in which to try to create reasonable doubt. Now, I do think he's trying very hard to create reasonable doubt, and I think he's definitely trying very hard to push everything off on Bortland Henry. But, uh, again, th that's going to be up to the jury. If the jury buys into that, okay, fine. But if the jury does not buy into that, then there's a good chance that Melly is going to be convicted. We'll just have to see what happens. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. Like, share, subscribe. You know all the stuff we ask you to do. If you have an opportunity today, it's a good day to go out and do a kindness for someone. Thank you for watching. Have a terrific day, and I'll catch you down here next time. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.